Weather is always the farmer's friend and enemy. But what we as farmers have to learn to do is to work with the weather and not against the weather. So forecasting is critical. That's the huge uh, challenge faced by the corporation and the government. Because we are talking about developing 100% renewable by 2017, but the demand for electricity will continue to grow. Once you're able to forecast, then you will be able to better decide when to plant, when to fertilize, if you need to reap earlier, if you need to reap late. So that is the goal of the government, is to develop uh, more hydropower plants and other renewable sources available in Samoa to totally replace that 70% uh, currently produced by the, the diesel generators. We know that many of the world's small island nations are highly vulnerable to the impacts of our changing climate. But now, some small island countries, such as Jamaica and Samoa, have started to recognize the value of investing in stronger climate services to help boost their opportunities for greater economic development. In this short film, we look at how Jamaica is using climate forecasting to boost production of its valuable Blue Mountain coffee exports. And we will learn how Samoa is using climate information to boost the efficiency of hydropower as part of national efforts to generate 100% of its energy supplies from renewable sources by 2017. We hear of the El Niño and La Niña, they all happen in the Pacific and any change in uh, this warm water that sits in the Western Pacific and, and w uh, when it moves or changes position, uh, the weather in the Pacific changes and it also affects the weather around the world. The main reason we can make forecasts for the next three months is because if the surface of the ocean is, is unusual, primarily if the ocean is unusually hot or unusually cold, that can have a, a, an important um, effect on the, on the type of weather that we might expect over a few weeks. And that's the beauty of seasonal forecasting because you are able to tell with some uh, uh, level of comfort or accuracy uh, that you'll get a certain rainfall or a certain yeah, uh, temperature uh, in the next three to six months. The Caribbean makes a lot of its money uh, out of climate, whether it's tourism and whether it's agriculture. Because the islands are so small, uh, it's also very sensitive to, to water shortages. Part of the reason is that there is a recognition that climate is a very important, uh, important factor in daily life. Coffee, particularly Blue Mountain Coffee, has placed Jamaica on the map in another light because it is, you know, um, world renowned and as such, people um, make that linkage between Jamaica, Blue Mountain Coffee, Coffee Jamaica. So it's, um, it's a pretty important crop. Japan is our major market, so most of our coffee goes to Japan. You have large farmers, but very few large farmers. The bulk of coffee um, production in Jamaica is actually done by small-scale farmers. In terms of an export crop, no coffee has always been in the top five export crops. It's probably about number, between number one and three at the moment. So it, the foreign exchange income from coffee is, is um, very important to not just the industry, but the country as a whole. In 2004, the Blue Mountain coffee industry was earning Jamaica up to 30 million US dollars per year in export revenues. But in recent years, the coffee farms have come under increasing threat from a damaging fungal disease known as coffee leaf rust. In 2013, we had a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy. And at the time, it seemed as, seems as if 
there was a blooming of the rust and it blew the spores, the hurricane, all over the Blue Mountain. So we had an outbreak. Uh, that's how the rust started. So you had initially farmers going into the field um, and spurs would, would attach to their clothing and they would go into other people's um, fields and then they would spread the disease that way. Um, so it's a combination of climate but also you know, behavioral practices and agronomic practices as well. My farm that I have, it used to produce like 130 bags a year I used to get from it. Yeah, when, that is, when it was in good, good produce. Yeah, in good, yeah, in harder, proper harder at that time. Yeah, before, yeah, the rough time came along now. Since before the rough time came along now. So I, I can, you know, in that time where I could afford to buy the fertilizer, the manure, give it the spray that it need and take very care, good care of it. The disease itself is driven by a number of climatic variables. We do know, for instance, that it is driven by high humidity, which is also linked to issues surrounding rainfall patterns. Also during drought periods, when it is extremely dry, the plants themselves, the coffee trees, are affected. Um, they get weaker, and that makes them more susceptible to the disease. Japan, to which we export most of our coffee, has a very strict um, pesticide residue regime, so we have to pay attention to, to, to that. Um, so spraying was not necessarily the answer at the time because we were losing trees because it, you know, it, the, the disease came on very aggressively. In discussions within the industry, outside of the, the, the country, the concept of planning ahead for the disease, for other pests and disease impact, came to the fore. In 2013, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, with support from the World Meteorological Organization, hosted its first ever regional climate outlook forum in Jamaica. At this meeting, a small group of partners decided to try and work together to develop a new climate early warning system to tackle the threat posed by coffee leaf rust. These partners included Jamaica's Coffee Industry Board, the University of Arizona, Columbia University, the University of West Indies, and the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Because I do pay attention to the weather, and I know how difficult it is to forecast. So of course I was a little skeptical. Um, but we've been getting information and I'm beginning to realize that some forecasting, long, medium term forecasting might just be possible. And of course that can be very beneficial for, for us in terms of planning. The challenge is how you can get farmers, how you can get scientists to speak the same language. And um, so we realize that there is a need to First of all, understand and mainstream um, indigenous knowledge. But there's also a need to kind of scale down and make simpler scientific knowledge and try to come at get some platform where the two can actually complement each other. Forecasting started sometime last year, just before the, the drought of 2014. That's when I first got into the forecasting thing. And um, they told us that it was going to be dry, drier than usual, most dry. And there was El Nino and all that went with it. And um, it turned out exactly what, how they said it is so, uh, would be, so that gave them credibility. So of course we're listening more this year. So every year as we've gone along, the, 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 the forecasters are gaining credibility. We've been talking to farmers, gathering their information, learning from their experiences. And the hope is that this will provide a solid baseline that we can use to fine tune the climate information and tools that can help to inform farmers later on in terms of how to manage these different risks. What has changed is that, let's say it's getting warmer, which it is, seems to be getting, we're in this, a warmer phase. Um, we now need to put in shade for the coffee. We need to start thinking about mulching if we're going to um, be experiencing less rainfall. So there are things we can do. Maybe we, we need to look at different varieties. 
the things that we can do if we are able to uh, predict the weather. For a small farmer, it means then that he needs to know how to organize his resources and apply his resources. They don't have the luxury of just putting fertilizers in the field. And then if there is an extended period of drought, all of that fertilizer will go to waste. Then where are they going to get their money from? Jamaica should be paying more attention to forecasting, but I think forecasting also have to prove itself first. And I think that's the only way they're going to have to earn it. It's not, Jamaica is not going to just say, okay, we are on board. It going to, it's going to happen over time. And I think we're off to a good start. I think so far, I'm, I'm very encouraged. And I think we just have to continue down this road and we will see what happens. More than 10,000 kilometers from Jamaica, the small South Pacific nation of Samoa is using climate forecasting to achieve its target of producing 100% of its energy from renewable sources by 2017. In order to achieve this target, Samoa plans to produce 40% of its electricity from hydropower and the remaining 60% from other renewable sources such as solar and wind power. Currently, Avulilo is our major hydropower plant. Uh, out of the five hydropower plants that we have, Avulilo is the only hydropower plant with a dam. But the other four hydropower plants are runoff river types. So we have very limited uh, storage capacity. And this is why Avulilo is, is very good in, the, in terms of uh, storing energy. Uh, for the dry season. So that's why it's very important our partnership with the, the med service so that they can inform us of what is coming so we can plan, plan ahead. We have uh, contributed to the efficiency and effectiveness of, of the generation of electricity in that side because before uh, there was no planning towards the rainfall. I'm, I'm talking about the rainfall uh, aspect, which is important to the recharge of the aquifers and the rivers that uh, uh, where hydropower schemes are, are generated. We were quite happy when we were approached uh, by the Samoa Met Office uh, and introduced the, uh, the water balance model. Uh, EPC is benefiting from this because uh, Having access to uh, weather forecast uh, well in advance, it helps us with our planning and forecast. So it also puts us in a position to make informed uh, decision. We work together with EPC with the dam storage data, both their past and current uh, records. And then we get the water resources division or rainfall, for, rainfall data for Afulilo. And uh, also nearby, we can calibrate uh, the model accordingly to the other stations. The partnership between the National Med Service and the EPC is an, is an excellent demonstration of how uh, information from the National Med Service and information from seasonal forecasting can be utilized to generate, to generate money or to calculate your risk uh, from uh, different impacts from climate? Well, we have seen uh, major changes in regards to the weather because 10, 20 years ago, we have plenty of water. But uh, nowadays, not only uh, the rainfall is reducing, but it is very unpredictable. So this is why we are quite happy with the partnership with the Med Service uh, Office. They are in better position to advise us what is coming. If you are really serious, I mean, it, it has to be an investment in both sides. Um, because for seasonal forecasting to be able to provide good data, you need data from the med service, and you will also need good data from, from the sector. We have in the pipeline the development of five more hydropower plants. So we have been collecting uh, historical data. I think after we develop uh, five more uh, micro hydros. Uh, it might take our contribution from hydro to 40 percent. 
So the rest of uh, the 60 percent, we will uh, look at other renewable energy sources. And once this partnership uh, is forged and is able to save money, then people will buy into. And because uh, at, at the end of the day, it's the how much financial gain you are able to make from a partnership. The World Meteorological Organization and its partners have established the Global Framework for Climate Services, or GFCS, to help countries address their climate challenges. With funding from the Government of Canada, the GFCS is assisting small island nations to develop climate services that provide information and forecasts for improved national decision making. There is no question that many of the world's small island nations are becoming increasingly vulnerable to the impacts of our changing climate. But it is also clear that a growing number of small island nations like Jamaica and Samoa believe that investing in these new climate services can help to provide their communities with new hope for a brighter economic future.